Hello. Okay, uh, Shannon. Um, hello, everyone. This is Neil Toft. I'm the planning director for the city of Larkspur, and we're starting a second um, study session for the general plan steering committee update. Uh, this study session is focused, it's our second study session focused on the circulation element. Our prior study session was last Monday evening and we're continuing with some business from that meeting. Uh, Shannon, if you can get me to share a screen, it's currently disabled. Doing that right now, Neil. Okay. Okay, just to quickly um, run through our meeting tonight, uh, what I wanted to go through was we had at the prior meeting did sort of a walkthrough summary of our circulation element workshop from May 15th of 2018 and our economic resiliency study session. Uh, that was also a public workshop um, from July of 2018. And we have the minutes from those. Uh, I'm hoping the committee members have each had a chance to look at the minutes and can adopt those as the uh, minutes of those meetings. And then we'll um, look at a summary of the August uh, 17th meeting. Uh, the consultants, we and myself, we kind of put together a short summary highlighting on the um, questions and uh, any direction suggestions provided by the general plan steering committee and any comments from the public. Uh, then we're going to go back, um, continue where we were working to complete review of the circulation goal sections. I think we kind of did a overview walkthrough of it and I'd like to quickly go through, capture any um, any particular edits or questions, uh, points in those sections, and then get back to uh, circulation goal sections three and four, particularly the topics um, regarding vehicle miles traveled, um, uh, level of service uh, and capacity improvements, uh, level and service standards, and um, uh, thresholds for review of, um, of uh, development projects. I did send out, I just sent out a little bit ago, a brief memo, which I'll walk through talking about some of those particular topics uh, as we get to them. Uh, so for the first uh, topic, I'd like to put up on the screen, I'm gonna take this off and and Neil, just one quick thing before I completely hand over the meeting for you. We have one member of the public in attendance uh, at this moment this evening. So okay. the, um, the protocol for um, webinar attendees is to, there'll be breaks in, the, in, our, um, in our discussion and please use the, the raise hand function and we'll, we'll allow, uh, enable the allow to talk feature. Um, and you'll be able to uh, correspond with the committee. Additionally, the memo that Neil is referring to in about 15 minutes will be up on the website for folks to follow along with. I'll be doing that right now um, on the general plan update main website. So that's cityoflarksburg.org slash general plan update. And I think before I begin the next topic, um, I'd like to ask, are there any uh, public comments on items that are not on the agenda tonight. I'm not seeing any raised hands. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to now move my screen share.
Are you guys seeing the circulation element update, the workshop minutes? No. No, okay. But, yeah, yeah, I am. I'm seeing him also. Okay. Uh, just quickly, I wanted to check if anybody had any questions or edits to these minutes, and if the if the uh, committee would uh, like to adopt these as a final minutes for that workshop. If you did have any questions or anything you wanted to change or or you'd like to continue this, uh, we do have the workshop um, uh, recorded and we're putting that up on the website as well. So the more detailed conversations are always available. It was about a two and a half hour, a little over two hour discussion altogether. Any questions, a motion? I'll move uh, um, the minutes from my May 18th, 2018 meeting. Be adopted. Okay. Be adopted. And uh, do we have a second on that? Sure, I'll second it. Okay. And if you want, all three uh, members could simply raise their hand since we're on screen. And I'm seeing all three members currently present are uh, raising their hands. So we'll consider these minutes adopted. Kevin's here also, so he's joined us. And his hands raised. And we have four, so we have four, all four of us. Oh, here. I'm sorry, I did not see him uh, there on the screen. Okay, good. Glad it's easy. Here, Kevin. It's easy to miss me. Well, you have one. I have one of those screens. You got to scroll up and down to see everybody. Yeah, and I and I actually couldn't see the minutes, but I I'm confident that my colleagues have um, scrutinized them carefully and we're in good shape. Okay, now I'm going to um, kind of do this next exercise really quickly with the. Uh, oops. Now, do you see in front of you the economic resiliency study session minutes? I'm seeing a yes. Yes. Okay. And, and, Anyone and, have any questions or comments or changes to these? And, and I'm not I'm not seeing those elements, Neil. So I'm not sure what I'm missing. Maybe there's a something I'm not doing right. Shannon, do you have a suggestion for Kevin on how to? I, I think it may be the way he's viewing the uh, screen. Let me um, let me get back to you in about when there's a break in the conversation, Neil, and look at it. I this is an issue we've run into before, but I'll need to do a little bit of googling about how you might resolve it. I actually might send something uh, via email to Kevin about how we might be able to to fix okay. it. Okay, because I can see all of you on you know on the 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 zoom display but I, I can't see the documents are you, are you seeing a lag in the documents kevin or are you just not seeing documents at all i'm not seeing documents at all the only way i'm seeing documents is when i'm looking up um for example at the memo that i'm pulling up as an email ah okay um all right i might send you a link that has a zoom troubleshoot for that issue all right it'll, it'll take about 20 minutes there, the may, there may be a way of shrinking the photo that the images um, of us and so bringing... in, in your, I don't want to derail the meeting too much, but in your upper right hand corner, Kevin, you might have something along the lines of swap view, swap shared screen with video or something similar, as well as a maximize or minimize full screen option. And if you try those real quick, that, yeah. that might resolve. Okay, I'll have no, to. I'm, I'm not seeing that, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep fiddling. There's also the toggle bar in between the images of the individuals and the, uh, and the memo and the material that Neil is sharing. There's a toggle switch in between so you can widen that. Or yeah, more. Uh, I'll, I'll fiddle with it. I don't want to waste your time with things. I'll, I'll figure it out. Okay. Uh, so do we have a, um, any questions or a motion to adopt these minutes? I would move uh, adoption of the minutes uh, for the 
meeting of 725-2018. I'll second okay, that. That's, that's Monty moves and- Catherine seconds. Anyway, seconds. Uh, all in favor, you could raise your hands. Uh, aye. Yeah, uh, I have to abstain, Neil, since I was not present at that meeting. Okay, Daniel abstains and everyone's in, otherwise in favor, three, in, three to one. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm gonna close out on this. Um, hold on just a second. And get to Okay, you guys should be seeing a GPU memo number 23, a summary of our, of our last discussion. Yep. Okay, and quickly just wanted to see, um, I had sent this out uh, later last week. Um, again, just trying to summarize and track uh, any topics and changes. These are not as detailed minutes um, verbatim as we were kind of doing before. Uh, I thought we'd really just focus on um, uh, action, kind of action minutes where, where there was direction or particular questions that we were to follow up on. Um, I did have comments from one of our speakers, uh, Cindy Winter, and as you can see, she clarified some of her um, comments, so I went ahead and added that into the memo. Um, her comments were regarding the concern about the increased use of e-bikes and the need to maybe create greater separation between pedestrians and bicycle users. Um, so those were some comments that she's provided. Um, I didn't get any comments from the committee, any questions or uh, clarifications on this or any direction you provided. We haven't, by the way, I would note, we haven't made all the edits that we've talked about. We're just still sort of gathering comments and questions before we provide a new version. Are we all good? Yeah, and, I, and now I'm actually getting your screen share. Neil, so that, that's helpful. Okay, um, and I don't think we need to walk through this. I think there were uh, a number of great comments made, some suggestions uh, regarding sea level rise, addressing that, um, just a number of, of points made, and we'll be doing some follow-up on a number of the points and the questions made here. Uh, we've begun discussing that with the consultants. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close that up. And I'm now going to go to um, bring up the current And let me get to share screen again. Okay, are you seeing the uh, policies um, quality of life? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted, what I wanted to do was uh, quickly sort of revisit this, go through it very um, quickly, see if there were other um, items or issues that we did not cover in the memo. Uh, Daniel had mentioned you had some 
um, comments uh, that I think you wanted to address, uh, some of which maybe were not um, not necessarily typos or, or minor edits, but maybe some other questions. So I thought we'd just run through this uh, really quickly, and then we could get to the more um, uh, the topics regarding VMT and level of service and trip generation. Uh, did anyone have any further questions on page one? Anything we haven't discussed? Yeah, there, there's um, at the very bottom of the page, there's a reference to public private partnerships uh, related to roadway paving. And um, I wasn't quite sure, um, I was trying to imagine what that meant exactly. Um, where is there an opportunity for a public-private partnership in the paving? Well, actually, there are occasionally public-private partnerships where um, the city has partnered either with, I, I, I do know of instances where the city has partnered with uh, larger landowners, particularly uh, multifamily properties uh, or commercial landowners that have partnered with the city in um, accelerating uh, paving improvements, uh, wherein if the city's been, and I, one example was up on Skylark, the road, yeah. the road to Skylark. I was, I was going to say Skylark is the one that comes to mind because I've, I've been up there. I don't think there have been a lot of these, but it, in some cases it does uh, occur that there is opportunity for encouraging some public investment or matching monies. Doesn't it also refer to that we have a half a dozen private streets still um, that are right. very short. Many of them are shorter that, um, that are responsible for their own roadway maintenance for the most part. I think right. that refers to Daniel. And like, for instance, the Larkspur Marina, they have their own assessment on road maintenance, uh, don't they? Or am I confusing that neighborhood with another one? Um, I think the Marina is our, our job. I think so. I think the Marina is ours. But it is, it does, um, it largely comes into play when the city's doing a paving project nearby. There's a lot of savings through, um, uh, while a while a contractor is mobilized, they can do that project. They can do, extend, go into another street, or do a private street while they're doing a public street. So, okay, and it kind of serves because these may be streets with that have public access, um, but the the city can't necessarily afford to do the maintenance. For the the purposes of clarity of the document, do you do you want to include that kind of uh, some kind of example such as that? Um, if it's not too cumbersome, I don't. I just don't know if yeah. we lock it into a certain example or concept. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, and I I I discourage that actually because it tends to highlight um, things that. Um, may create expectations of priorities that okay. I don't All right. know that we want to do. Okay, understand. And I think this, uh, I'll be very, you know, to be very blunt, I think that this program and policy was a lot more urgent uh, before the city passed its measure B's and C and B, I think it's C and B, um, the road improvement measures that have done a lot to um, really fund the uh, neighboring um, neighborhood streets that really were not um, well addressed with uh, federal and state funding. Um, anything more on page one? On page two, um, we talked about quality of life and uh, Right. Some of these uh, policies and um, kind of the emphasis on making, uh, I think it sort of becomes a kickoff towards um, the, the bicycle pedestrian master plan and everything. Um, we did talk a good bit about Marin General Hospital. Yeah. Um, under under uh, 
2-6, where it says encourage vehicular travel traffic to use designated arterials. Right. Um, is there, um, do we have any incentives in mind? In, encourages um, a little bit vague. Well, the uh, um, Magnolia Avenue is, con and, and Doherty Drive are actually considered collector streets. So the major arterials are the highway and Sir Francis Drake. Um, David, uh, do you have any thoughts? I mean, this is kind of a policy sitting on its own. Um, or are, are there any programs or suggestions? <laughs> well, I think we have other, we have other sort of way, we have other policies and such to try to encourage that. But. That's a good comment. Maybe, maybe we revisit the word encourage because obviously we want to, um, through, through signal timing and uh, operational um, enhancements, try to make, try, try to really make the uh, arterials the most appealing route for through traffic, right? Um, there could be education. Um, that's also part of the picture. Yeah, that could be sign in, signing, that could be wayfinding. So let's revisit the term. I think the idea is try to get the through traffic onto the arterials through through any means possible, right? Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, so Neil, which item are we on right now? What? Um, we're just getting. We're just. Kind of running through page by page. Yeah, we've right. Actually we've covered things, so. So um, we have, we haven't gotten to the hella uh, port issue, right? Well, we discussed it a lot in the last meeting, and I think the, we we uh, we did. Yeah, and the direction was to take the policy statement out for a separate discussion. Um, right. The question is, Kevin, do you think of that as a separate discussion outside of the? general plan update or maybe as a maybe as a safety a public yeah, health and safety policy yeah i don't I, I just don't know that it really belongs here um it, it does feel awkward in circulation it does feel really awkward in circulation it's not within our jurisdiction it does raise a variety of issues that um are relevant to our community but um I'm I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with this kind of a statement. I, I agree with that. I thought a lot about it after the last conversation. I think there's a lot of data we still need. Um, and I think there's a lot of anecdotal information as opposed to real uh, factual yeah. that needs to be acquired before we make a position statement on it. Yeah, and I, and I would really be reluctant to see it built into a planning document. Okay, so yeah, I think I, that so is the direction here to really move it out of a pilot out of well one to move it out of circulation. I think two, should there be any direction to in the planning document to consider uh, or or take a more critical position? Um, again, we don't want to get I, yeah. I don't. I, I, we don't want to get crosswise with the hospital, but. Um, I just don't, first of all, I, don't, I just don't think it belongs in this document. Um, I do think it is worth having an ongoing conversation within our larger community about what, what they're doing in terms of that uh, support service, which, which is a fine conversation to have, and I don't ob object to it. But uh, Hal Brown Park is not in Larkspur. It doesn't impact um, our uh, our circulation because our, our road is not outside of uh, that park and it's not outside of the hospital. So I just, I just don't think we have any business having this in there. Okay. And uh, Catherine, do you agree, agree with that? I do. I don't think it belongs in this document. 
Um, I think the conversation about a helicopter and the, the need for it in our community is worth further conversation at a different time. Yeah, yeah exactly. And it's worth a robust conversation with the hospital, <laughs> not, not, not building it into our planning documents. I, I agree with all of that as well. Uh, uh, just a, a question. Uh, the hospital itself is not considered to be in Larkspur's zone of influence because there, there, there are certain areas which are actually outside the city lines which are considered to be within our zone of influence and the hospital is not. Does that apply to Hal Brown Park as well? I don't think Hal Brown Park is in our I, if the hospital isn't, I can't imagine the park is. Yeah. We had, I think Petfield was taken out of our sphere of influence yeah. um, several years ago. Yeah. Kind of at, the, at our own urging and concurrence think, with the county. Yeah, I think that the county is very jealous of their prerogatives over in that part of the community. And some of, some of the reason for that related to uh, Rena, Rena allocations as well. The city of Larkspur was getting hit with additional shared Rena allocation for an area that we did not envision really becoming uh, part of the city. So it was removed from the sphere of influence. Yeah, I think we ought to get get rid of all that. Yeah, I would concur as well. Makes perfect sense to uh, not incorporate something outside of our actual boundaries or influence. But I think that I think it's hard to have language that tries to direct how it's done without sounding like you're supporting it in some fashion. So or, the, or that you have something to say about it. And, you right. know, we, we do have something to say, but not in the context of our local planning. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over three and oh, actually four. before before you do that. Um, uh, Neil, policy circulation 3-1, you see there's a reference to destinations across the region, including places of employment, shopping, and recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, can we add the word residence to that? Because I know in the, uh, in the housing element, we, you know, we've considered having areas that are mixed um, uh, commercial and residential in the future in order to satisfy our, um, our allocation. So does it make sense to add the word residency to that list? So to, including places, places of, of employment, shopping, recreation, and residence. Well, Leonard helped write this. You know, I'll, I'll let him weigh in on a, on his thought. Um, I don't see that there's any problem with that. Yeah. Okay, um, I do want to get back to these sections uh, as after we get kind of make sure we knock out all the low hanging fruit um, and we'll get back to here. Uh, there's a bit of good discussion. We talked about the, as part of policy four, we did talk about the parking uh, policy and the um, various action programs for parking demand management and strategies reduce parking um, and make it more efficient. Any questions or thoughts on those? Um, I did have a, a question on, uh, that would be on page five, action um, policy uh, 4-2. So it would actually be the policy statement, which was actually inherited from the, uh, uh, from the previous um, iteration. Uh, developers should pay, um, Developers should. Oh, if, if I could ask, if I could beg to indulge us, Daniel, I wanted. Sure. I think this is going to be something we're going to discuss in the context of uh, VMT and. Okay. And transit, uh, measuring transit, the impact of projects on transportation, VMT and LOS. Okay. So I wanted to kind of jump back to that, kind of get okay. through, get through this, uh, these other topics. Parking, 
Um, we did not make a lot of changes to hiking trails and access points that were adopted by the CAC. Um, and I think we talked about, we did really enhance <clears throat> the areas of transportation alternatives uh, with a lot of focus on the bicycle pedestrian master plan as a tool um, for future um, detailing of uh, the bicycle and pedestrian transit network improvements and programs and as a tool for funding those projects. Um, any questions on, on um, circulation six, 6.1? or edits. Not seeing any? No, no, I think that's that's um that's it except for you know tiny little nitpicks. And then anything on page uh three dash nine more follow up on bicycle master plan uh policy six point two we talk about um sort of an added some language relative to uh, the city's historic hillside stairways, um, kind of tying it to both public convenience and safety. No, I think that's yeah. good. Uh, um, with regard to the to the bicycles, I didn't say anything earlier because uh, I hadn't brought it up in the previous meeting. Um, but I think uh, uh, Kevin and others had uh, had voiced some concerns about, uh, and and Cindy as well, had voiced some concerns about bicycle about the safety on the on the pathways as uh, bicycles, particularly electric bikes, uh, speed up. Um, and we hadn't mentioned whether uh, additional signage on some of these routes might be a good way to try to limit to to limit the uh, the speed. Um, so if there were speed limits on the bike paths. Um, also, you know, as an example, I mean, there, there's a, there's a portion of the path um, which was striped about a year ago um, to separate lanes from, um, you know, different from coming uh, in opposite directions. Uh, and, and to my mind, that almost encourages higher speed on bicycles um, because it makes it essentially makes it look more like a roadway. So I was wondering if any thought had been given to, um, and I don't know if that's part of the circulation element or if that's a health and safety thing, whether um, whether there should be some speed restrictions uh, on the multi-use pathways. Well, I, I do think um, some of what you're getting at is really something we're trying to um, emphasize as using the bicycle and pedestrian master plan as, a, as the the main tool for some of those standards mm -hmm. uh, and design details, but uh, the purpose—the purpose of the circulation element here—is to provide some guidance to, you know, sort of overarching guidance to the bicycle and pedestrian master plan, and it, it may bear mention. Right. You know, I think number one, mentioning that there is a concern with the just the volume of more bicycles, and then having a lot of these bicycles become e-bikes uh, is certainly increasing the potential for conflict uh, or, yeah, well, you know, bicycle, pedestrian, bicycle, bicycle conflict more than I think was anticipated during, right. you know, these initial discussions and even the current bicycle master plan. So it may bear some mention, David, do you have, I, I know you were away last week, so we didn't have a lot of, time to think about this, but, and we were going to kind of get back to that, but I think you're just providing a little more um, emphasis on the concern and it's well taken. Well, I uh, would just say, you any thoughts? yeah, I do. I mean, the bicycle and pedestrian master plan has to be updated every, every five years. So at a quicker pace than the general plan. Uh, and these are issues that are, um, evolving, particularly with e-bikes and speeds right. and all that kind of stuff. The uh, bike and ped plan will be, I believe, Neil, it'll be just kind of brought into the general plan, right? Um, it'll be, a, it's going to be referred. It's going to be part of. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think as that evolution occurs, you know, these will be, these things are going to be up, continually uh, updated uh, every few years. But again, that's, that's a separate 
plan, a sub plan of the circulation element, if that helps. I mean, it's, again, that's just gonna continue to evolve. And, and, and that's, that's fine, this is Kevin. Um, I do worry a little bit about the, the, the fact that the technology with bikes <laughs> is changing so quickly. Um, and there's a, I think a tendency for people to think of these e-bikes as yeah. just bikes, but they're not, they're mm -hmm. essentially electric motorcycles. Um, and I see them going around our neighborhood all the time. They go fast. The people don't pedal. They just zoom. So, um, I, I don't know whether we need to do it in this context or in the context of the bike and pedestrian plan, but I think there has to be some recognition of the fact that this is a this is a technology that is different from what we may have envisioned only a couple of years ago. And Kevin, I think this is stuff that every jurisdiction is dealing with. Yeah, you know, my yeah. understanding. I don't have an e-bike yet, <laughs> but I guess there's three different levels. I mean, they look great, but they look, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely get one at some point. But you know, I know they have different speed ranges and that kind of stuff. But I have to imagine, um, not only will our have to deal with it, but every jurisdiction, there'll probably be some new laws and DMV laws. And, and, and yes, and, the, and it may be appropriate to just kind of sit tight and wait until that gets, gets sorted out a little better because that, you know, the, the higher powered e-bikes do seem to be a different kettle of fish and probably need to be addressed in a way that's different from, you know, what, you and I are used to thinking of as bicycles. Yeah. Sure. I, I, I do think that within the context of this circulation element, we're at a point where it, it, it probably bears a, at least a, an action program or something that kind of provides some direction for the bicycle master plan to recognize the need to uh, expand and make sure these facilities are safe, recognizing the proliferation of bicycle use and e-bikes. Yeah, and without, I'm not... Without necessarily getting into too much of the, the detail and really kind of provide some guidance that I think we, the council can utilize in the near future, the plan... That's, can, that, that's fine. And we'll, we'll work on some, I think, a general kind of a generalist approach to recognizing this conflict. I think if all the, all the members kind of nod their heads that they agree this is, it, it, it is a substantive issue, we'll, we'll include some direction there. I, I think it is a substantive issue because they're becoming quite popular and the, the, the bikes are becoming more and more powerful. You know, I see people driving up, you know, the street in front of my house, La Cuesta, which is a fairly steep hill. And these guys just, they just, they, they run those things up like a motorcycle. So they're not really bicycles, even though they kind of look like them, but they're really, they're really motorcycles. And they're, and they're heavier than other bikes. So in the case of, the, in case of yeah. an accident, it would be uh, you know, more, more so. I mean, I, I think the, you know, the, the, the pro of this is they, these could provide a real balance, a real reduction Oh yeah. Vehicle use, so that it, you know, Oh, I'm not. I'm not criticizing the use of it. I just want to make sure that we're recognizing this is a right. technological development that we probably have not anticipated in the past, and um, and and people are using them. I mean, I think that they look like a ton of fun to to ride around on, but at the same time, they're not a bike. They're more like a motorcycle. Yeah, Neil, if I can chime in something. One of the bigger problems I see, and I agree with Kevin that the, the bigger ones, for lack of a better word, they are a small electric motorcycle, even though they're not licensed and they don't have any requirements that uh, the, the operators understand what they're up to. And on the multi-use pathways, you have a lot of other people who, who I ride a normal bicycle and there are a lot of the dog walkers, a lot of the families that will be walking five abreast, the dog walkers on the wrong side, and you've got to grind to a halt and where they figure out like, oh, there's somebody else out here. And the city at some points has had placards or signage at the entrance to pathways that say, hey, you know, stay to the right, 
share the share the path, etc. And this is only exacerbating that where it just needs to be a greater um, understanding by all all users and the e-bikes need to probably understand you're working, you're getting close proximity to people that are not aware you're there, um, may not realize how fast you're moving. And it's, uh, it's kind of surprising there haven't been more problems. So maybe, I don't know how you accommodate that in this document, if it's something more pertinent to a bicycle um, type of uh, document. But that's my observation. Well, it's certainly, uh, I, and I do think it, it probably is deserving of enough of more signage to the degree that we have a lot of signage on the roadways, signaling, striping, things like that. So as we see this use increase, it's going to deserve more attention in terms of maintenance and signage. So we'll, um, we'll be working on coming back with, I think, uh, some direction to emphasize that in the uh, for the bicycle master plan. Neil, before we move on, I see we have a hand raise from one of our attendees. Would you like to take that comment now? Uh, sure. I'm, I imagine it's on topic. It's Cindy Winter. Um, I'm going to uh, enable the allow to talk feature and uh, join us when you're able to. Hello, this is Cindy Winter. And I was going to talk about item 11.3 C, the definition of a motor vehicle. And I can wait till we get there or I can talk about it now because it is directly relevant to e-bikes. So it's your choice. Um, I'm sorry, you said 11? 11? 11.3 C, which says by ordinance, prohibit motor vehicles except for public safety vehicles on paths and trails. And my comments have to do with the definition of a motor vehicle and their effect on e-bikes. Eleven point three C. I see here. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll have to look at that. That's a good catch. <laughs> good catch. Very, very good. Now, okay. Um, it seems like an innocuous little action program, but it raises some some difficult issues that all arise from the new electric micro mobility devices. First. The vehicle code section 415 defines motor vehicle as a self propelled vehicle. That is also the federal definition. One entire category of e bikes is self propelled. Mm -hmm. These are the most powerful models traveling at up to, they're using four horsepower and they can go at about 30 miles per hour. However, many other e bikes those that use less than one horsepower and have a top speed of 20 miles per hour are not self-propelled because the electric motor will not turn over unless the cyclist legs keep turning over too. These are classes one and three, and yet class two of these one horsepower e-bikes is self-propelled. In addition, <clears throat> We now have e-scooters and e-skateboards, which appear to me to be self-propelled. Regarding 11.3c, if you do not define motor vehicle, somebody may claim that all e-bikes should be kept off paths and trails, when in reality, by definition, a great many should be permitted there as long as no alternate facility is provided for them by ordinance. So I would suggest amending 11.3C simply by adding, perhaps, motor vehicle is defined as a self-propelled vehicle as stated in CVC 415. But how can e-bikes be monitored so as to know whether any which one should not be using the path 
And what about those self-propelled e-scooters and e-skateboards, which by definition should be used where? With other motor vehicles, such as Toyotas and UPS trucks on the street? There is another issue. The pose an e-vehicle on a path runs down a walker, causing severe injuries. A claim would be filed against the city for allowing the said motor vehicle on the path. As for the e-vehicle defendant, assuming he had a homeowner's policy, it will exclude motor vehicles. However, if this person had been riding a class one or a class three e-bike, any such denial of coverage would be unwarranted. Likewise, the city could not be held liable because that bike did not fit the statutory definition of motor vehicle. However, there still remain those other e-bikes and the e-scooters and the e-skateboards. So I leave you with this conundrum in hopes of wiser heads than mine can decide what to do about it. And I'll send a copy of this statement to our planning director tomorrow. And I have another statement that's more detailed that I wrote in June about homeowners coverage for e-bikes. And that has been vetted by an attorney. It's more detailed. I'll send that to, to um, planning director Taut also. That's the end of my comment. Well, Cindy, I just really want to uh, uh, express my appreciation for you to highlight this issue a little bit more. And it, it, is, a, it is a complicated one. And these different devices need to probably to be treated in different ways, but um, you know, it's important that we are more sophisticated about how we uh, view them. Let I know here, we need to. Uh... Yeah, this is this this is this is actually a fairly significant issue, I think. Because these 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 different devices are proliferating all over the place. They all have different characteristics, some of which are create greater risks than others, um, but they all have their their own challenges. So, all right, Cindy, do you have any other statements before I place you back on mute? If you have another um, statement later in the meeting, please raise your hand again. All right, thank you. And I appreciate the, um, the comments from the Planning Commission because I have spoken with a lot of cyclists about it and they don't want to hear it. They, they just want to get more e-bikes out there and I can understand their point of view, but as many people have said this evening, there, there are some considerations that have to be carefully weighed. Yeah. Uh, can we go back to 6.2? Uh, pardon me? I just want to make sure we don't, uh, can we go back to 6.2? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Uh, sorry, I kind of overshot. Yeah, we're back to the stairways. The only comment I had on that was, um, I know what a paper street is because I've read the history book, but maybe we need to define paper streets. How we define them. Okay. The, um, I'll make sure we either have this included in de definition or we'll provide definition here. Because that, it's kind of a nebulous term. If, I mean, I know what it means, a pathway that's on paper, but not real, uh, not a real street. But I think it needs a definition. Yeah, I mean, the, because the paper, the paper street is really the right of way, which doesn't have, doesn't necessarily have road or pathway on it. But the street refers, I mean, that right. the word street would mean an automobile. And I, we have two paper streets next to my property and an automobile could not go on them. So would you, would you suggest just rephrasing this as unimproved right of ways? That, that'd probably be better. I mean, you could say paper streets because that's the term Larkspur is used. Paper Larkspur. streets, but un clarify unimproved right of ways. Clarify what it is, yeah. Yeah, paper streets is a little colloquial. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
So we were talking about alternative transportation solutions. Um, and any questions on, so we got through paper streets 3.9. Any questions on um, Three point ten, and I note in three point ten we do include a policy that um, discusses using generating a traffic demand management program, a countywide program that might be used as a tool for mitigating development, um, which kind of goes back to a discussion we'll have uh, under goals three and four. Uh, so this kind of links back to the discussion of mitigating development projects, potential options to do that. And we've got three jetney services. Um, and I think we talked about all this last week. Just want to check if you had any particular um, comments or anything we didn't get to. Can you just go back on the, the list of people that in public transit that we're trying to encourage? I thought, oh, let's see, it says, uh, blah, 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 blah. Um, transit needs of residents, workers, oh, students. Okay, I see students in there. I didn't see it before. Um, what, so, what, uh, where are you at? Sorry, I'm going to. Uh, action programs uh, 6.4. I just want to make sure we included students because a lot of our traffic issues and circulation problems are caused by student drivers and parents driving students. Good point. So I just see it in there. I didn't see it when you scrolled by before. And, um, and this policy circ five circ through circ seven are really um, coordinating with the various transportation agencies, as well as the smart line and the ferry terminal. Um, now the policy does encourage continuation of Larkspur Ferry Terminal at its present location. I don't think the bridge district has any significant plans to move the terminal. Um, <laughs> Not now they don't. I know. <laughs> uh, any questions on 3.11? And, uh, and then I note on 3.6, we talked about expedite charging infrastructure or alternative fuel vehicles. And uh, one of our comments from the last meeting was including, and this may be a part of this or the bicycle pedestrian master plan is charging for EV bikes, um, making that available. And the final policies were encouraging more mobile food trucks, public gathering spaces, and updating the ordinance to encourage more mix of local resident serving uses to both support and be supported by the neighborhoods. Um, Neil, can you go back to the, to the mobile food trucks? Just want to see the language on that again. Okay. Because uh, to me that 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 looks a little broad. I mean, there's certainly, as we've seen over in Larkspur Landing, um, uh, appropriate um, support opportunities for those kinds of um, operations. But I, I I worry a little bit about just, just encouraging. I mean, I, you're you're saying review and you're, you're basically you're saying review and update the ordinance, I guess, and then that's that's fine. But um, uh, I'm I'm just wondering if we could have some language in here that would um, uh, make sure that as we as we look at that issue, um, we we pay attention to where the location of food trucks and similar types of mobile services would be. You want, you, 
you feel this maybe needs a qualification or a qualifier? Yeah, uh, yeah, something. I'm not quite. Does not disrupt, you know, local neighborhoods. I'm trying to think in general terms of what what the potential issue or the problem may be that we're trying it, to. It, 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 I, I would think something more along the lines of. Um, where those services have traditionally been provided. So, you know, they they have been traditionally provided in in Larkspur Landing in a couple of different locations. Um, but I'm not sure that, that this language would um, do anything to prevent, for example, having um, you know a whole bunch of food trucks plop down in Bonaire Shopping Center, which I don't think would be appropriate. Well, I guess I guess the question is how much you want to narrow it as well. I think the I do think the intent of the CAC was to try to um, through the zoning ordinance try to loosen up to allow more food trucks and it says such as food trucks, it's not necessarily limited to that. I think the intent was to try to get, um, and I'm not, and I, I, I have to say, I don't remember exactly what the other various concepts that were in mind, but was to, I think, try to provide more services that are accessible to sort of surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and 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 I understand I understand that impulse. I'm just kind of mindful of the experience that San Francisco had, where they allowed kind of rampant um, uh, availability of food trucks, in particular on city streets, you know, where they weren't paying taxes, um, among other things, um, and creating obstructions to vehicular traffic and and uh, creating other 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 challenges. So, um, you know, maybe this language is fine. Um, you know, as long as we're dealing with it within the framework of a zoning ordinance. Well, you, but I, I don't want I don't, I, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to, to make statements that we're encouraging these things in a way that could be compromising our existing um, commercial food services, for example, restaurants. <laughs> Um, hmm. I mean, you you could you, you could just add um, something in the order of encourage you know, non disruptive or non obstructive uh, mobile consumer services, something like that, that would give you some cover. Yeah, I'm kind yeah. of thinking so, something in a that does not disrupt, uh, obstruct, or disrupt traffic flow or uh, disrupt, you know the neighborhood character, um, something to that effect. Yeah, yeah or is, inca is incompatible with the surrounding commercial um, yeah, area. Because they're used to doing it over, you know, in the country mart. That's fine. Um, and I think even at Bonaire, from time to time, it's, it's maybe appropriate, but um, those mobile services, are, while convenient to many people, uh, do they don't generate sales tax revenue? I don't think, and they do take away um, uh, business from established um, places. So, and I think that that was that was certainly the experience in in San Francisco. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, because I, I think we'll add, add some language to kind of limit or provide some framework for that. So as you say, it's yeah, not, just just not just long. just just provide some cover. I don't I don't think we want to you know go beyond that, but um, uh, necessary to encourage. I mean, encourage seems like not the right word necessary to accommodate Comedy. where appropriate or where, where appropriate right. would be maybe better okay can do that 
Um, so for the ex internal and external linkages, we just really wanted to kind of enhance this a bit by identifying that we're looking for safe and convenient linkages. Yeah. You know, on 7.2.a, uh, where you list Corn Madera, San Rafael, and the County of Marin, do you want to add Mill Valley? The only reason um, I say that um, is that further below, um, we're encouraging the reconstruction of the Alto Tunnels, of, uh, which would then link Larkspur to Mill Valley. So do you want to, uh, do you want to add Mill Valley to that list of localities? Sure. Just so it's consistent with the, you know, with the encouragement of the Alto Tunnel. That's fine with me. Anyone else? Any other thoughts on that? Um, okay. Uh, do, do, do. I, I'm going to weigh in on that one, that one. If you go back real quick, it looks like that's focused on north south. Um, so are we on seven? Which one are we looking at? The same, the, the connections that, you know, like you guys were talking about the Alto Tunnel. Um, right. You know, there's been a big emphasis with the Richmond San Rafael Bridge. So, um, may not want to lose track of, you know, jurisdictions on the other side into the east as well. Yeah, to say East Bay. Right, okay. Uh, I agree with that. So do I, in, in, in which event you might want to get, you might want to replace the word adjacent because the, yeah. the East Bay is not specifically adjacent. You could say neighboring, that, that should be, that would work. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the time when I feel comfortable getting on my bike and riding across the bridge. I get one of those fast e-bikes. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have friends that I have friends that do it. It's it's not a particularly pleasant ride. Those uh, you know five miles across the bridge or whatever it is. Well, but it has nice views. Yeah, but you've got you got those trucks going by almost on top of you. So <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> and we had, um, I replaced a prior action program that really was focused on the, um, the highway interchange project with kind of a more generalist scope that we, I think we had talked about before. Um, just again, continue to look at the safest most efficient and uh, convenient on off ramp configuration for the corridor. I think we're going to continue to see challenges with the um, with that arrangement. And um, we did have this action program to encourage redesign uh, uh, Highway 101 interchanges, taking account flooding hazards and future sea level rise. I think we'll reemphasize that in the um, safety, uh, safety and hazard section as well, as well as other areas around there. So we're gonna look at that. Um, these sections, uh, we basically combine these into linkages. So this was language that we had moved up. And then this language, to and between retail areas just really seemed like a, just about enhancing multimodal circulation. Um, we've added some of these into transportation alternatives. So we, we kind of just took two sort of orphan uh, goals and included them into policies under the other goals. Um, Magnolia Avenue circulation, again, we had um, 
focus on that. I think we've talked about that last week. And then we finished up with uh, circulation and safety with some emphasis on identifying um, uh, areas that need improvement for sea level rise. And I don't think we kind of, we got all the way to um, emergency vehicle access. I'm not sure if we got through all this. I think we did. Um, we talked about, <clears throat> we did talk about the need for um, addressing signage and bottlenecks for parking and so on. So I think we've got direction on that. Uh, any other questions as we go through these? Any other specific points? Page 316, um, page 315. And... Neil, it's Kevin, just, just real quick. Um, do we address um, the need to avoid um, bottlenecking at intersections? Well, by bottlenecking, do you mean as in terms of uh, people parking their vehicles in, in yes, and identifying the streets that are subject to constrained ingress egress and create potential bottlenecks. Yeah. Okay. All right. And Good. That 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 that's important because that's a that's an issue over here. All right. So I think we we're doing that, okay. um, and I think we have some additional direction from our last conversation. All right. um, I have a question. Do we do you think it's worthwhile to include language that involves our neighboring jurisdictions, just like we did with the bicycle uh, transit? Because people will be moving and evacuating uh, across jurisdictional boundaries. Sort of like we just did with uh, talking about the bike uh, and our neighboring circulation needs. Does that make sense? To get off of Palm yeah, Hill. Yeah, I want to go back to that um, linkages. Look at that language. Um, I can't see it. So uh, this is this is continue to maintain, update the BMP, the Bicycle Pedestrian Master Plan, template linkages with other communities. Right. So that same language might be um, might enhance our evacuation uh, comments because right. our roads intersect with each other for major evacuation routes. Does that make sense? Yeah, Leonard, do you, do you think we address this to some degree in the health and safety element? I don't, I mean, I don't think we really talked about connections to other communities in terms of evacuation or that level of coordination? I don't think we did. It certainly, we could certainly add something here and we can go back and check the safety element just to make sure we haven't, it doesn't hurt to address it in two places anyway. So uh, I think that's a good idea. Okay. I, I think it'll also be consistent with what the new uh, JPA um, with the wildfire protection plan is going to put together too, which are evacuation route planning for regional areas as opposed to just individual cities. Okay. I think that's good. And I may check with um, our fire chief on if there's actually somewhat technical languages or <clears throat> plans that we should be referring to relative to that as well. And that might be linking the circulation element to a evacuation planning efforts. Okay. Okay, with that, I'm going to go back up to um, our circulation 
sections uh, three and four. And um, I'm gonna, I think, try to do a split screen here. Uh, I wanna look at our document that we had put together. Um, I was using some language that was provided by Parisi, by David and Patrick. Um, and let me pull that out. See if I can get this all to fit on screen. Okay, can you see both of those documents? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna be bouncing back and forth a little bit, bear with me. Um, so what I sent you was there were really three, sort of four principal topics that we wanted to go through in here. Um, number one, in this memo that I sent out or just a little bit earlier before the meeting, I'm providing a lot of background regarding BMT. A lot of this we've discussed uh, in the prior workshop. The purpose of BMT is by state law to really reduce greenhouse gas emissions through uh, use of vehicles and particularly single occupancy use. And so a lot of the land use planning, the CEQA standards are now going away from LOS as a standard for efficient movement of vehicles towards VMT to really reduce uh, the amount of vehicles tra miles traveled. And <clears throat> in doing this, they, these two measurements have different effects on the community because LOS is really about level of service, uh, the convenience, uh, the comfort of traveling through the community. VMT is a different measurement, which really seeks to reduce the amount of miles people will tend to or have to travel for work uh, or whatever reasons they, they do so. And so it's really seeking to um, not necessarily make vehicle circulation as comfortable. And it's looking towards encouraging people to use transit facilities, alternative modes, or and to, to put jobs and housing in closer proximity to each other to avoid really long commute um, patterns. So it has a variety of, you know, a variety of impacts, I think both that it's trying to address and impacts to the community, but uh, LOS is no longer a standard by which uh, CEQA measures um, impact. So, this has some explanation of that. While it's no longer a CEQA matter, cities can still apply level of service as a standard for development purposes and can implement level of service restrictions into, um, into, their, uh, into their general plans as a planning and into their zoning ordinance for development. But to give you a little, um, background, one of the things we wanted to get to is that in this general plan, we're not necessarily recommending a specific VMT policy. Um, to do VMT, you have to have, uh, there is right now a standard by the, um, by OPR, which allows cities to use the regional average of vehicle miles traveled and to target a, projects and plans which reduce that by 15%. And I think if you have questions on this, hopefully hopefully David and Patrick can provide some clarification. But I think in general, the point of VMT is primarily as a CEQA review, um, but it is important for cities to begin to look towards how they would, to create a policy on how they would 
apply VMT regionally or else the default is this regional um, measurement, which is not a very good measurement to apply to the locality of Larkspur. Applying the Bay Area right. standard is a, is a poor measurement. And the County of Marin right. has developed the data. Uh, they are developing a model that we can piggyback off of in order to create a more local standard. Um, and there are various different ways you can apply uh, VMT in order to kind of create a baseline and identify what your policy is that you as a community are trying to meet. But that is also consistent with the state goals. And in doing that, you develop significant thresholds. Uh, so there's forecasting models, which involve a lot of data. And then from that, you can develop significant thresholds by which you can test a project or even test this general plan. When we, uh, when we begin preparing the environmental review for this general plan, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to do a VMT analysis of the land uses and any changes to land uses provide, proposed. Um, so the, the state law does allow um, lead agencies to develop and adopt their own significant thresholds or rely on thresholds recommended by other agencies, provided they adopt such threats. The adoption is supported by substantial evidence and that is good data to support it. And uh, we believe Transportation Authority Marin has developed a model that is a, is a good standard. Um, and we have not at time at this point adapt, established significant threshold. So we do have to rely on the default of the, the greater region. Um, but we can develop one and uh, it must meet the statutory goals to reduce greenhouse gases and it must include development of multimodal transportation networks and a diversity of land uses. So it's really trying to mix jobs and housing together. Um, so in this general plan, we have, uh, we are recommending that we don't identify a policy directly within the circulation element. Um, right. we a separate process. Um, the general plan is for developing broad policies um, and with particular focus on three statutory goals, uh, we can do this, but um, VMT is a relatively new metric. There's a lot of changing data and uh, these thresholds may be subject to further changes in the near future given right. the activity. So, we're, we're proposing we would do this by resolution of the city council in the near future. Um, but we do have language uh, in the general plan, which uh, policy 4.2. Yeah, can you highlight that? That is this policy here. I'm going to bring it down a little bit so right. it stands out. It's not broken up. Um, so this provides a very general recommendation to um, develop, develop a, a policy for VMT. Uh, we're recommending per capita or per service population based on countywide estimates and using countywide modeling. Um, David, this is this is sort of some general language. Is there any suggestions, anything else we ought to be viewing in terms of recognizing this as a CEQA model? I know that much, a lot of our language regarding alternative transportation does refer to the desire to reduce VMT. Mm -hmm. We kind of have that sprinkled through the circulation element um, but we're not really addressing any any other form of specific VMT measure. You know, I'm not sure. Patrick may want to weigh in, I, but I do think it's important to keep this somewhat broad because the whole VMT 
area is uh, also evolving. So you're going to want to be able to, you know, develop your policy outside of the general plan. Um, Patrick, is there anything you'd, you'd want to add? No, I mean, I agree with the need to keep it broad at this point. Um, I may even take out some of the specificity around the uh, where the VMT reduction strategies come from um, because we may want to include you know more updated research as it as it becomes available. I think the policies that have been developed so far for the general plan would lead towards uh, 15% reduction or meeting VAT thresholds in the in the future. So it's important to view the general plan through that lens. Do, would the policies support um, developments that would um, result in a reduction in VMT? And I think they do at a high level. But but again, I would keep this policy broad at this point. Should it have any reference to meeting state guidelines or state guidance? Anything like that? Uh, in, 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 in the, this is Kevin. In, the, in, in that um, sense, I, I would agree with the comments that uh, David and Patrick and Neil have just made is to keep this as general as possible because uh, commuting patterns are changing at a higher rate of speed right now. And, you know, some of the metrics that were developed for VMT made assumptions that people would be commuting long distances. That's not happening. Um, and I, I worry that we kind of lock ourselves into expectations on our planning that are based upon assumptions that commute patterns are what they were a year or two ago when they're likely never to be that way again. Right. Yeah, I think so. This is actually a, a good amount of verbiage kind of giving you background on BMT, reinforcing some things we talked about, but ultimately, while, I, as you said, a lot of the policies in here are, are prescribed to really reduce congestion but and reduce BMT, as well, um, and we see that as a goal. They're not prescribing a specific policy, and this is right. just that will lead right. us to something where we can resolve how exactly. Because um, right now we're going to be relying on the the default is the regional is the regional data, which we don't want to do. I, which I agree with that. Ultimately, we'd like to do better than that. Um, yeah, that we don't want to do that constraining to our development. Um, we want something that's going to be a little more based on our local um, adjusting according to local baseline. So, Right. And, 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 re and reflecting uh, changing uh, uh, commuter and transportation patterns for our residents because we're not going into San Francisco anymore. We're just, that's just not happening. Um, there's obviously people will be transporting themselves around in different ways. People are also going to be reluctant to be using certain types of public transportation because of COVID. That hopefully will be a fairly short term period of time. But I think there are some longer term trends that have just been accelerated by COVID, which will have an impact on what will be happening within um, uh, how we transport ourselves around. And uh, uh, I, just, I just want to make sure we're forward looking in terms of our planning as opposed to just kind of accepting assumptions that were built into planning principles that um, were developed two or three years ago. Yeah, that, there's, there's also telecommuting. And that's, I guess that's going to be. No, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's pretty hard to quantify at this point, And it is somewhat conjectural as so. to how long term the telecommunity will be, but it looks like a lot of it's here to stay. It looks like a lot of it is here to stay. And, you know, we're, we're I mean, I'm seeing my own family, um, people are not going to offices anymore. Um, they're working out of home or they're working locally in local facilities. They're not transporting themselves around um, in the way that 
they used to, and a lot of these strategies were built on assumptions that people would be commuting into large metropolitan areas, big cities, Salesforce, all that kind of stuff. That's just not, that, that doesn't seem to be a realistic strategy going forward in the future. And I just want to make sure our, our planning is forward looking and flexible to accommodate what those changes are inevitably going to be. To be clear, though, the TAM model includes Larkspur specific data. I mean, acknowledging, yes, it was, it was collected pre-COVID, um, but it does go down to the jurisdictional level. Oh, and that's fine. And the, yeah, and, and I, 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 I understand that. Um, um, and, that, and that's good. And I think our community may be unique in certain ways, but uh, the whole VMT model was based upon um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions associated with significant commutes. And those aren't going to likely be happening in the future, so. Right, the result of that would be that developments in the future uh, would likely meet VMT requirements, but there's still a need to create thresholds. Oh, I agree. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not disputing that. We we okay. need we yeah. need to have re reasonable standards. We just need to have standards that are reflective of what seems to be happening in society at large. And what is happening in society at large is that the traditional model of people making long commutes into big cities or highly developed areas like Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. That's that's. That seems to be disappearing. Yeah. David, do you have any? I mean, I think I think the one the one qualifier I would say is, I think it's reducing a lot. I don't know if I want, I, but a, a part of it is we just have to be flexible at this point. We have to kind of consider it is going to change. Right. It is changing. Yeah, it's interesting because you know we've looked at some uh, we've done some peer reviews of some traffic studies and other jurisdictions, for instance, for Biomarin in San Rafael and people that go to Biomarin uh, commute long distances. And that, you know, that's a case where they are going to have increased VMT um, per capita. But what's interesting, and Patrick, I'm going to turn to you real quick. You know, if the trend is, you know, as Kevin is suggesting, you know, shorter trips, what is the baseline? Remind me, what is the baseline we're comparing against? Is it 1990? What, what's the... Uh... the ba I don't know when TAM collected their data, but TAM's model would um, identify existing or the base. Okay. And I, I don't remember when that was collected. Uh, and certainly I can find out. Because when we're talking about a reduction, we got to understand what our what our baseline is. That's right. So I think I'm kind of giving us an assignment <laughs> with the things changing so, so fast. It's like... Well, what is and this this is exactly the conversation we ought to have and yeah. in the context of our work on our general plan and other planning documents uh, and this is just a reflection of the conversation we've already had mm -hmm. we need we need to be flexible because uh, transportation and commuting patterns are in the process of changing as people are restructuring their lives around different business models right it's just that's just the way it is and we shouldn't expect that to really change anytime soon because i think some of these changes even though they're prompted by uh, you know maybe hopefully short term circumstances they will have long term consequences for the way in which people live their lives get around work and do lots of different things that have an impact on traffic and and transportation well, I, I think we can hope that it will result in reducing VMT. Um, okay, so I think we're on the right track there. And yeah. let me talk briefly. There's the acceptable LOS standards. Uh, part of the 1990 general plan, there's language, this is basically language from 1990 that was carried over to the CAC version, um, they essentially <clears throat> said, well, we'll continue with that standard and 
when you do the EIR, let's study um, where this traffic congestion still exists or doesn't exist or where it's maybe worse and we'll identify, we'll kind of revisit the, um, the various <clears throat> intersections and their performance uh, after we do the EIR, but kind of in concept keep these level of service, which is D for signalized intersections at peak periods and C for unsignalized intersections at um, peak periods. And in the um, memo I mentioned to you, which wasn't reflect, it's not reflected in the draft, but under the um, current general plan, which was amended under city council resolution 992, um, the, uh, the three signalized intersections that were accepted to perform less probably at level E or F um, were Sir Francis Drake at Elysio, at La Cuesta, and at Bonaire Road. Um, so those are three intersections which are actually marginally, um, they're within, sort of partially within the uh, purview of Larkspur. They're largely managed by the County of Marin. Um, and Magnolia Avenue, when it's the unsignalized intersections, were identified as Magnolia Avenue on uh, William, Baltimore, and Wiltshire, um, which um, kind of, when I look back, I hadn't thought about this much, but it surprised me a little bit because it hasn't been my experience that these intersections necessarily perform that poorly. Um, I, and I think the situation may be uh, people trying to get onto Magnolia Avenue during peak app from the side streets. Um, David, do you have a do you have any thought as to why these might have been identified as performing that poorly? Or don't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, no, um, I'm not exactly sure. But a couple, two things: the way level of service is measured has changed over the past couple of decades. And we use, it's delay based uh, now, whereas it used to be volume to capacity uh, years ago. Uh, and it's a lot more um, um, scientific, I'd have to say these days. In a way, you know, level of service is also kind of like vanity sizing <laughs> in a way. What was C before is like D now. What was D before is E now. The, uh, the tolerances have, have changed a bit. Regarding those at Magnolia, uh, how uncontrolled intersections are assessed from a level of service perspective, Neil, you're exactly right. It's the stop sign controlled movements. It's not the through movements that are not stop controlled. Those don't get a letter grade. So Magnolia, William would be um, just those coming out of William onto Magnolia. Okay. And same with Baltimore, Wiltshire, um, same deal. I don't know why those were selected. Historically, maybe there was folks that just didn't, you know, over the course of an hour peak period, uh, the, the congestion or the delays were intolerable um, in those days. Well, yeah, uh, I, I live actually um, two blocks from that, that intersection mm -hmm. uh, at William. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it is about an hour in the evening where mm -hmm. uh, there are both delays on Magnolia Avenue uh, headed north. Uh, and during those periods of time, it's uh, uh, people that are emerging, emerging from the side street, either Baltimore Avenue or William, would have a difficult time making a left turn onto Magnolia in order to head south. Um, but that's kind of the extent of it. Yeah, I mean, the issue for the, these kind of streets is what is the remedy? right um the remedy to if, if there is a service level that's not acceptable you know to get it out of william the remedy would be making an always stop stopping all of magnolia or putting a traffic light up or or doing some major reconfiguration so it's 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 kind of a double-edged sword yeah it is, it's this is not the worst traffic problem <laughs> yeah and just the 19 general plan 
we didn't have the reconfiguration of the uh, Larkspur, uh, of the Perry's area. We didn't have the lane right. in North Magnolia at Bonaire. I mean, there's been a lot of changes since then, so I don't know if these, this list of six are the most relevant ones at this point. But yeah, that, I mean, and I think the other, yeah, you know, and so this is going to the question that I, I did want to point out. What we've done is, uh, when what we've included in this memo is sort of some of the concerns about identifying L peak hour LLS that may be under some conditions or periods of time challenging to meet as a standard. Um, and uh, like setting LOSC as a standard may result in oversize of the intersections. You've got to create like a, a, a turn, a turn in lane, a, uh, a like an extra, you know, safety lane to be able to get into, um, or, or stops. Um, and one of the other points I made here is one of the ways that you address these LOS as you increase capacity. And aside from, aside from signalization and more efficient signalization, and there are ways to do that, um, there's actually a little, very little land for us to add, um, in many of these cases, very little available land to add capacity through additional turn lanes or uh, through lanes. And, um, and to some degree, there's a little community, there's not much community interest in terms of adding capacity improvements to Magnolia Avenue. I think on one hand, we'd, we'd like to see a comfortable LOS, but on the other hand, if you develop it to meet that LOS, um, it's going to be, you know, continually be that de default through lane when traffic is a little bit worse. So we, we, we kind of deal with this catch-22 constantly in, in the way we look at the LOS. So we've um, modified the standard. The other, the other point I wanted to put here is much of the, I think much of the traffic that is really of a concern for Larkspur is regional traffic that is traveling through the city, whether it's through the highway or Sir Francis Drake or through traffic cutting through Magnolia Avenue um, because of because of backup on the on the main arterials. And you know that traffic is regional traffic is going to be a result a lot of result of re regional development and regional planning. There's a lot of planning underway to try to reduce VMT, enhance transit. Um, and those are the efforts that maybe are better suited than trying to lock Larkspur into um, having our own development and have, having to meet a higher standard or be constantly tested against a standard. And that's kind of the question. I think we want to keep LOS as a, as a tool for reviewing development, but we may want to be a little more circumspect about how uh, diligent or how um, strict we are in terms of applying these levels. And we've added some language in here that's trying to qualify that a little bit. Um, so Neil, what, I mean, your memo is very detailed to outline what, why you concluded what you did. What do you, what, what kind of feedback would you like from the four of us who are here? I think your memo is very, um, provides a lot of information as to why you reached that conclusion. Um, do you want just our support for that or do we need to uh, enhance it in any other way that would be helpful for you? Well, I think I'm looking for, yeah, some feedback on the, the language that we've included, which is kind of qualifying this or whether we really want to look at a, um, a little more of a, uh, in, I don't know, maybe you can help me, David, because we haven't, we haven't really jumped to saying here, we recommend this, or, you know, here's the standard. We're really trying to get a sense of, um, 
can we can we prioritize the type of development improvements we want over and and a complete streets approach over LOS as a standard. And I think if we get that feedback, we can look at how to do this. In yeah. doing that, I, I do want to mention, you know, David has been clear, we don't really want to just ignore LOS. It is a factor in any large development project that we may want to consider um, uh, exactions or some improvements or some level of recognizing that if a project is going to have a significant effect on LOS, that may be more of an impetus for uh, impact fees to enhance um, alternative circulation modes, TDM programs, these types of things. We don't necessarily want to, um, uh, I think, uh, eliminate this standard, but we do want to look at how we might apply a, uh, a more practical approach to how we judge LOS. I, I, th I think going back to the conversation we had before, it's important to maintain flexibility. And in my mind, it's also important to maintain uh, the opportunity to use LOS as a standard for evaluating uh, projects uh, in addition to VMT. Because I think in our local community, LOS is probably a more meaningful uh, approach than VMT, not to the exclusion of it, but um, uh, I think it's really important for us to keep that as, as part of, you know, the tools in our toolbox. Let me, let me add a couple points here, and Patrick, please uh, chime in. So L LOS um, helps really provide a... Uh, it's a good tool that can tell you a lot of things, right? Um, not just the delay of an approach or the overall intersection goes from C to D or D to E. Yeah. But it also helps you understand is a left turn pocket, is the queuing going to extend beyond uh, the storage area in the left turn pocket and then people are gonna have to hang out in the through lane. That's, right. that's important when you're evaluating projects, right? Because that's a safety implication. Um, so it is a tool, I think, that, it, that is helpful. Uh, on the other hand, it can't be used for CEQA purposes, right, Patrick? And so... No longer a CEQA impact. Right, right but, but it can certainly be applied to help make decisions. Is there a safety implication? Um, is the signal timing going to have to be um, changed? Those kind of things, right? Yeah, um, but just to, just to reinforce that point, even though it's... it's uh, um, its utility in a CEQA context has been diminished. Mm -hmm. As a planning tool, it still is important. And I think, you know, regardless of CEQA. So I, th I think it's really important for us to continue to maintain um, the ability to use that uh, as a strategy for planning decisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, CEQA is one thing, and I'm a big fan of CEQA, and I, and I think everybody here knows knows that uh -huh. um, but um, CEQA has certain uh, certain objectives that it tries to accomplish but those aren't all necessarily objectives that are consistent with good planning and um, we need to continue to be able to preserve uh, useful tools for planning purposes when evaluating projects. It, it would be important to manage uh, residents expectations about how super, or sorry, LOS can be used though, um, because it would be difficult, for example, to say this is going from LOS C to E because of this development, let's widen the intersection at the expense of sidewalks with or a bike lane. <coughs> that would be very difficult to do under current CEQA uh, regulations. So it's a good planning tool, but it now has its limitations. I, I, and I, 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 under, I understand that. Yeah. Um, um, but I think that's a manageable issue, quite honestly. Um, I think we can, we can work out the planning implications of decisions that we need to make to preserve, you know, the character of the community, quality of life, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, and still be consistent with um, what CEQA requires. I, the, to me, this is an administrative challenge more than anything else. 
So, so where are we with this section? Do, Neil, what are you feeling? Are, are you feeling like we're getting somewhere on this or do you need more direction? Well, I think, I think we're getting somewhere. Um, I guess the question is, does the, does the committee feel, I, and, and it sounds like maybe what we need to do is make sure we're being kind of clear on how we can apply LOS in a way that we're not um, hamstringing uh, the city or tying our own shoes uh, together, so we're really hamstringing, you know, the development that we want to or need to see. Is this something you think we should revisit? Because you do say to be added after EIR is completed and to be added after traffic study is completed. Would that give you more data? Well, that will that will provide more data, um, and I think we can come back uh, to you know, to revisit this at that point in time. And I think what we've done is, what I want to make sure is we're kind of consistent with, we've, we've added policies to try to qualify this a little bit, where we're saying um, these are the acceptable levels of services, you know, where feasible, um, maintain standards for acceptable traffic levels during peak periods and where they cannot be maintained due to new traffic generated, require other measures to reduce peak traffic and or reduce VMT generated by the new development. Now, I think we're kind of thinking VMT probably doesn't belong in this section here. So we're looking at revising that to really look at this solely as a matter of congestion um, as opposed to necessarily VMT yeah. reduction. So that's one thing that we're looking at internally is kind of how do we, how do we qualify this a little more so we can um, not have, you know, we're gonna have development, particularly housing development um, that we're gonna be looking at, which is going to, you know, make some of the, make, make for some challenges at some of the intersections and which are already probably experiencing some peak, or at least under normal pre-COVID conditions, experiencing some peak challenges with some of these, um, these levels. And one thing that I was gonna do, um, David hasn't had the chance, but we we're gonna go revisit and try to really see what intersections are likely um, at these levels or in jeopardy um, in, in our, know, under our general plan, in our current condition and under our planning effort. Um, and that, that, sound, that sounds perfect to me, Neil. I mean, I, I don't view VMT and LOS as inconsistent. Um, it's, I've always thought that LOS, given the fact that VMT is now built into the SQL process, that's given, that's fine. Um, they're good policy reasons for doing that, um, but from a planning purpose, as long as we're, as long as we're acting consistent with our obligations under state law, and we also uh, have separate objectives from our community perspective to manage circulation in a way that achieves our LOS goals, let's just do that. So they're 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 not incompatible. They're really not. David, your thoughts, your thoughts on that? Are we able to meet both challenges given the, the constraints on our capacity? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> David, I've always appreciated how you are. We will know more. We will, we will figure out. Yeah, more. no, we'll chew, we'll chew on it. Patrick and I will chew on it with you, Neil. It's been something we've been kind of like a, uh, uh, pinging on and thinking about, but I hadn't really, uh, hadn't really finished uh, consider uh, really working that through. Yeah. But I do think we're going to have to look at LOS, you know, you know, number one, I think we're looking at how is it measured today as opposed to 1990 and earlier. And that's fine. And, 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 the, and that's fine. But I think the challenge here is to make these two models work together. 
um, in a manner that's consistent with our state law obligations and what makes sense in terms of circulation patterns within our community. Mm -hmm. And the um, and I think that goes to part of the part of the question was one thing we haven't developed here are really the thresholds for requiring traffic studies is and and again I'm just kind of looking for some general feedback that we can work on and refine. Um, but as I, as we've talked about our current uh, policy C and our current trip cap ordinance really generates, requires some level of traffic study for just about any commercial expansion, particularly that or any, any change in use uh, that might be considered more intensive. Um, you know, uh, anything north of the creek is very highly uh, uh, constrained. And I think some of the feedback from both the CAC several years ago, as well as the steering committee, is that we want to really be a little more flexible towards changes of use and sort of minor redevelopment of sites, of existing sites, but really apply these, um, apply traffic, the, the requirements for traffic studies and the requirements for traffic exactions and fees to those larger projects that are going to be likely to be the ones that are going to be more of a game changer in terms of as some local traffic impact or a larger traffic impact uh, relative to the to the surrounding region. Um, so we're looking at these thresholds for traffic studies and one of the things we looked at was well what is required under the guidelines for VMT and um, you know again traffic studies are valuable for the reasons that David indicated. They're gonna give us the ability to look for where we may need to add alert turn lanes, add signal, improve signalization, or really require a development to have programs or other alternative um, tie into alternative transit and potentially add, provide fees that may not be our current general plan the traffic impact fees are all funneled towards vehicle uh, improvement. It's all very vehicle and roadway based. What we're looking at is a transportation impact fee, which would look at these projects and particularly ones that are high traffic generators that need to be mitigated and possibly put those fees towards TDM programs and other uh, bike and pedestrian infrastructure to help reduce, to do the measures that are needed to reduce the impacts of those, of those developments. Um, so that's kind of our take. And uh, here we've kind of described uh, what under OPR for the technical advisory guidance provides screen setting thresholds that are actually pretty high um, by NERC's first standards for development. Um, we have a lot of our housing sites and a lot of our commercial sites are within one half mile of a major transit stop or high quality transit corridor. Um, and so under CEQA, these are presumed to be less than significant. Um, small projects that generate less than 110 trips per day may be assumed to be less than significant impacts. Um, and then there's other screenings for impact. Um, uh, Patrick, am I to understand then, I mean, are, is, Lar is Larkspur because we have, um, if the newest guidance has any projects when within one half mile of a major transit stop, or high quality transit corridor, is that, does that include not just Sir Francis Drake, but is that Magnolia and Doherty as well? Do you know? I believe that's Magnolia, Doherty, and 101. And 101? 101 corridor. Because it sounds like we may actually be exempt from 
VMT under or projects within those areas? Or is am I assuming too much there? No, that is that's correct. Um, there's some uh, what I didn't include here. Are th there are some exemptions to this that they've outlined, uh, but this two points. One is that this is the, this is the guidance that the your the VMT thresholds would address. This is what is recommended by OPR, okay. and the thresholds that they've set for an assumption of um, environmental impact or not with regard to VMT. But you are correct in that the way you're reading it is that most of Larkspur would be assumed to be, most development would assume to be a less than significant impact. Okay. For CEQA purposes. For CEQA purposes, purposes. correct. For circulation, okay. So which begs the question of whether we wanna look at um, actually in terms of LOS impacts, continue to look at potential impacts of, of change to LOS level um, for projects or to look at some other level of VMT um, in order to uh, be able to implement uh, uh, mitigation measures through our local ordinance uh, right. on projects. As, 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 a, as a matter of our local planning authority. I mean, I, I don't see that uh, we can't still try to accomplish those goals. And is it fair to say we want to do this relative to development projects um, that are not really of the nature of reuse of existing sites? I, I guess one question is, do you want to, do you want us to explore some language that kind of sets a bright line um, for existing commercial sites or mixed use sites. Uh, and it's something we could come back with some ideas, but because I, th I think the number one concept we really want to get out is just to be very flexible with commercial uses, changes of use that are commercial, changes of use um, within office buildings um, and, and maybe look at to where there's new development where the change of use is from one category of use to another category of use as opposed to um, just changes that might be one that seems as um, uh, changing uh, trip generation, for instance. I think that's fine. So it sounds like we're on the right track with this section, Neil, and then we'll hopefully revisit it <clears throat> with a little bit more refinement after David and uh, Patrick have had some time. Okay, and a couple of things just to look at this real quickly. Um, we're gonna remove detail on that. Uh, I just wanted to ask the committee, one of the action programs that was a carryover for which was the policy development should contribute measures to mitigate projects, local regional traffic impacts. Um, one of the programs was to develop programs to take advantage of any sales tax revenue for transportation improvements. I don't know that this is a, um, this might sit more comfortably as a policy, but as an action program, you're almost, it's almost begging that you um, develop a program to uh, target sales tax improvements to revenue, sales tax revenue to transportation improvements. And we've already adopted a, recently adopted a, a sales tax, a bit of sales tax for road repairs. I don't know that there's much revenue um, to give specifically for roadways. I just want to get your thoughts on this program. No, I, 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 th I think that's not necessary. You mean you would eliminate that line? You I think we would eliminate. Yes. That. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I had flagged that as well. Uh, given the given the various other funding mechanisms within the city. Yeah, 
we're just we're just right. it's just a it's just a way of tying hands. We don't want to do that. Okay. Just want to make sure. And I think that was the. I think that was the other, that was the main gist of it. One thing I did want to add is we're looking at, there was a very detailed list of capacity and safety related improvements. Um, as I mentioned here, that list was very much vehicle based. Uh, there was a number of intersections, uh, some capacity improvements. I think there's very little that we're going to look at here. We might generate a small list of capacity improvements. Um, but we also wanted to lean towards, and I'm going to be talking with David about how we might see if we can wrap um, while we're not, while this is not the bicycle and pedestrian master plan, can we in general terms try to wrap uh, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure into uh, circulation improvements or transportation improvements in this list? And that then begins to tie or create our nexus for impact fees in the future. Um, so just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Uh, that's something we're exploring. Okay. But much, much of what was done from 1990 has been either completed or is really no longer applicable and we'll, we'll kind of vet through that list for you. Okay. Yeah, uh, on that, um, that that last point on the uh, um, 4-2, I was wondering if, uh, if, the, if the formulation of the policy is um, clear and contemporary, uh, given what we discussed. Uh, it says development should contribute to measures to mitigate a project's local and regional traffic imp impacts. Um, to me, it's not really clear what that means. Now, if you, if you got rid of the word A projects, just development uh, should contribute to measures to mitigate local and regional traffic impacts. I think that to me would be actually clearer. So say that one more time, Daniel. I'm sorry, so, I was getting So ready. your poli policy, uh, you have 4.2. Four yeah. Just, just the way the policy is stated, um, to me lacks a little bit of, it's a little bit nebulous. Okay. Um, so if you just actually said development should contribute to measures uh, to mitigate local and regional traffic impacts and get rid of the A projects. Yeah, that's fine. Because then that leads into what the action programs are actually about. Yeah, no, that, that, that's appropriate. That's fine. Yeah, I think that actually kind of ex expands its purpose. Broadly. David, do you agree with that? Let me unmute. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I think with that, um, we've gone through the, the largest uh, amount of changes here. We've got a little more noodling to do on um, resolving kind of like making sure we have a comfortable approach to LOS that continues to implement it as a tool for um, addressing impacts in, in yeah. the neighborhoods. So we'll, we'll continue to work on that. Okay. Um, I think rather than set our next meeting just yet, I'll be revisiting with the consultants and get back to you guys later in the week on um, some further scheduling. Yeah, it's fine. This has been a great, great conversation. And I, I want to thank very much, Neil, your tenacity in pushing this through. Um, and David and Patrick, your uh, your your great contributions and making us uh, careful and thoughtful about what we're trying to accomplish. Neil, I'm seeing, that, I'm seeing we have a raised hand. Yes, so I'm going to go ahead. Um, the The speaker is Cindy Winter, so I'm going to go ahead and allow um, enable the allow to talk feature and start when you're ready.
right. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, talking about impact fees from new development, I don't know what's going to happen um, with the Ross Valley Sanitary District property. But last meeting when Daniel Kuster was talking about Larkspur Landing Circle, it stirred my own thoughts about that intersection, the east intersection with Drake. I have often wondered about building a bike pad overcrossing of Drake at the east end of Larkspur Landing Circle. When even one pedestrian pushes the crossing button, hundreds of cars traveling both ways must come to a stop emitting a great many additional greenhouse gases, depending on what is developed in the sanitary district land. More pedestrians and some cyclists may be wanting to cross there. I remember asking Bill Whitney about it maybe a year ago at some meeting, but after about 30 seconds, our conversation was cut short by an interruption. And all I recall is that he did not sound encouraging he had some concerns about locating the ramp on the water side of Drake. If the engineering staff is not already aware of the details, perhaps someone might reach out to Bill and try to determine if such an overcrossing would be feasible. This item does not appear to be on Larkspur's bike pad master plan, but in my view, it would be a safe, useful, and pleasant civic amenity. And that is my comment. And I cannot imagine all the work that has gone into this plan. I am just overwhelmed by thinking of all the hours and careful thought. And so I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Okay, I'm going to disable the, um, the participation function. Okay, um, I think uh, Cindy did bring up something that uh, had been, so it's, there, there had been some discussion on that possibility. I think that was discussed during the smart station area plan as well. Uh, process. So I'll take a look back at some of that discussion and some of the, um, I, I might call them pros and cons or some of the, some of the certainly opportunities and the, some of the issues with that um, approach. Uh, certainly it is, it is recognized that that, that that development and the connector to Drake's Cove will um, add to activity into that intersection. Um, so I'll, I'll let you guys know what, what we kind of come up with in terms of that question. Any other, uh, any other questions? No, it sounds like it's ready. It's a wrap for now. Okay. Thank you, Neil, for your hard work on this and maybe we'll get it done by the end of the year. Fingers crossed. Oh, I sure hope so. We're getting, we're on a, we're on a track. I think okay. we're on a track. This, this, this is a big hall so i think we're in good shape great okay right. i just have to i have to line up some land use policies with these policies and we're just about there great. thank you okay thank you thank I'll you uh david and leonard um do you guys want to try to make a uh why don't we connect tomorrow to just make a follow-up call sure Okay. 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 Thank you, everybody. So